This video is brought to you by Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which uh, this episode actually inspired me to start watching recently, and I'm delighted to say that it is already really, really good, as this extremely funny moment from the second part of the pilot should demonstrate. All right, put me out of my misery. You don't have the gun. <laughs> Have you ever had your heart broken? Have you ever felt the all-encompassing joy of submerging yourself within the pillowy mounds of mashed potatoes? <laughs> I mean love, floating within that translucent and heavenly feeling? And then one day discovering that that precious person has slipped away, leaving your withered heart abandoned within a dry creek bed of desolation, like a discarded shopping cart, the handle of which was once worn by your lover's grip, but now you rest in a heap, with all memory of that soothing embrace fading, fading away into an icy and forgotten chill. Uh, yeah, me neither. I kissed Marie on this couch! Now, Hank, that's not what this catch is for. Thank goodly goodness that we have this marvelously well-written and reflective episode to take us through a tragic love story. The structure of this tale is particularly noteworthy as we get to see the entire lifespan of this romance play out. We begin with its rather cute inception, go through its surprising moments of discovery and times of strife, and, most importantly, to the way that Bobby manages to live with himself after surviving his lowest emotional trenches. And honestly, this episode comes at the perfect time in the series' lifespan. We just saw Bobby go through a terrible time of angst in Propane Boom Part 2, Death of a Propane Salesman, where he was so deathly afraid of what life would be like without his dad in it, so giving him even more challenges really allows us to appreciate the depths this character is able to reach. This is a kid who feels pain, and unlike the pain he felt in the Jimmy Witchard episode, this season is giving Bobby more agency, dare I even say more liberty, 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 in how he deals with his problems instead of just having him blindly follow whatever Hank tells him to do. I don't know, Dad. This is vandalism, and vandalism isn't cool. Bobby? That attitude is a little immature. Remember every pony, it isn't enough to have a character just overcome challenges, there need to be moments of introspection. It doesn't matter how many bullets bounce off of Superman, we need to see him realize that every bullet he takes is one that won't be harming an innocent life. And for somebody like Bobby, who has had these romantic inclinations brewing in the background ever since the episode Square Peg, uh, and we did get to see that a little bit in the Caves episode also, it is so satisfying to see him finally go through the full dating experience. I'm a little worried about being a slut. Uh-huh. He is finally able to make the big leap from just being our fun little buddy and into a more self-actualized person, a kid who is willing to explore romantic companionship and the experiences that come with them, even if his parents aren't prepared for their little boy to enter that romantic thunderdome. That means when she was three, our Bobby was only one. It makes me sick just thinking about it. So how does this fantastical journey of romantic intent begin? Well, as so many new and exciting things so often do, Bobby's relationship stems from a sudden and unexpected meeting. <gasps> hey kid, where's your hall pass? Get going. Ramon. Bobby Hill? Yeah. Oh, you're good. Oh ho ho, this is just like one of my Japanese animes. Look out, my dress up darling. Your tacky ass is about to be taken over, dominated by the Texas heat. My friends think you're a riot. I really was choking at the food court, but don't tell them that. That's right, it's a god dang slice of life romance episode, one that takes bloom in the humble halls of Tom Landry Middle School, which is a great choice of location and is actually kind of a special thing to see, as King of the Hill is generally disinterested in the minutia of the kids' school drama, barring a few notable examples. <laughs> I pulled your pants down. That's it, that's the whole foul. So yes, Bobby's initial run-in with this giant of a girl comes with a rather immediate spark, one that also has a casually cool and smooth exchange of verbal interplay. You got me. My name is Ramon Tavares. I'm in Mr. Powell's class. Ramon Tavares? And why does your lunch bag say Bobby Hill? Because we can't spell Ramon T what did I say? <laughs> the magic of this interaction is that it feels genuinely and immediately intriguing, something that naturally begs to be explored. 
And a lot of this has to do with the amazing job that Sarah Michelle Gellar does voicing Marie. Our girl Buffy has the kind of voice that feels very familiar, one that has a definite suburban or even like nostalgic kind of vibe. I'd almost want to say it's generic, but not in a bad way. More of a like, oh yeah, I've met some nice people with the same kind of sound. I've known like three girls throughout my life that have this exact voice, so I understand what this character's general persona is going to be like, that kind of thing, you know? Even though she was only 22 at the time of recording this episode, oh, Geller, as I call her, perfectly fits as Marie, miraculously matching the same sort of vibrant energy that Pamela Adlin brings to the role of Bobby Hill. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> Bobby's ability to make Marie laugh via his spot-on impersonation of an Arizonan is what catapults him into her good graces, with her even showing him off to her friends and going so far as to call up Bobby after school. Hello. Hi, can I speak to Bobby, please? I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. Who was it, Dad? Oh, girl, asking for someone named Bobby. This is a really smart way of utilizing Hank in this kind of, like, Bobby-centric episode. He works so damn well as the out-of-touch dad, one who's looking at the Bobby situation from the outside and providing us with small nuggets of golden insights that have nothing really to do with uh, moving the plot forward, but which feel so important, so vital at the same time. My girlfriend Marie's a vegetarian, and she says... Ah, uh, there it is. I knew this was too good to be true. It allows us to understand that Hank is really just, like, fundamentally unprepared to deal with the changes that are going on in his son's life, leaving him more than a few steps behind. Hi, does Bobby Hill live there? Uh, hold on a second. Son, it's one of your friends playing a prank. It's also really nice that we get to skip over a lot of the smaller details, the unimportant shit of the relationship, such as like whenever Bobby and Marie decided to exchange phone numbers, and instead we get straight to their core interactions. Like when Marie gets Bobby on the phone, she decides to cut the bull and invite him to join her and her friends for a trip to that most teenage of Stonehenge's, the mall. How fun. Hmm, actually, do teens still go to the mall these days? I have no frickin' idea, as I'm one of those cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers, and I don't like to meet with other people unless it's for lunch. All I do know is that the pandemic really killed a lot of the businesses at my local mall, and now a lot of shops are just sort of closed off, blocked off in these, like, vacant lots, giving the whole building, like, this sort of, like, haunting vibe. If anybody here has ever played Puppet Combo's Murder House, then you'll know the kind of vibe that I'm talking about. I've even heard some dark internet rumors that abandoned malls are being used as bases for human trafficking, with tunnels being dug in a series of hidey holes that feels like it's straight out of the fucking walking dead, so, uh, ooh, that's a little terrifying. Uh, 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 but I do go on, don't I? Don't I? <laughs> but yes, uh, forgetting all that for a second here, uh, Bobby goes to the Dead End Mall, and we get a scene that I have to say drags on a little bit too long, one where Marie is really going into this big thing about vegetarianism, and Bobby seems completely unable to process the information. Well, I don't eat anything with a head on it. Well, I'm a vegetarian, Bobby. I don't eat meat. This is perhaps the only big misstep in the episode, even though it does have some very funny lines in it, uh, as I feel that this mall scene is somewhat in conflict with what comes next. Bobby so clearly fails to impress Marie and her gaggle of nameless friends with his BLT and then LT comment, so following this up with Bobby and Marie immediately taking things to the next step on the couch is a bit of an uneven shift. Also, I feel the need to point out that this fellow, this dude in the jersey, has a rather distinct and very, like, sort of notable appearance for someone who only appears in a tiny part of the plot. In fact, this is a good opportunity for me to say that I really think that King of the Hill's clothes and character designers typically show their strongest work in how they portray and dress older middle schoolers and high school kids. Do we have anybody short? Where's that petite kid who tumbles? Rosemary? She moved to Oklahoma. These designs seem to have a lot more thought put into them, with certain styles being more specific and prolific than the generic adult clothing that we typically see on the older cast. However, in Marie's case, her eternal overalls are kind of nasty in my eyes, because that seems like the kind of outfit that you only have one of, rather than Bobby's like short pants and shirt combo. I can reasonably believe that Bobby is still rocking the same style with duplicates of his clothes, but Marie? Like, I don't know, it looks like she's wearing the exact same shit throughout the whole week. Just, like, yuck. It makes me sick just thinking about it. Oh, and uh, I want to talk about one more thing before we reach our first, like, truly scandalous moment. 
I really want to make it absolutely perfectly crystal clear to you guys that I do not believe that either Bobby or Marie are bad people and that I think that there is more than enough blame to go around on both sides for how poorly this relationship, if we even want to call it a relationship, was constructed. I really wanted to make those points very clear before we move forward because I think the internet discussions about relationships tend to hyper-focus on just like, okay, who's right and who's wrong? These kind of conversations have the bad habit of painting one person as a pure victim and the other as a scheming monster in a winner-take-all kind of way. Hell, that whole like, am I the asshole discussion board on Reddit has really trained a whole heap of people to think of morality and relationships in terms of like pure black or white, yes or no no. And in this case, I do not think that either kid was acting with poor intentions or like acting maliciously because I really don't think that there is a definitive villain in this episode. Yeah, it's probably all for the best. These are just two very, like, extremely inexperienced kids who happen to be really, really bad at communication. Marie especially seems like the kind of person who hasn't fully developed her personality yet or has, like, any true awareness of the world to back up her philosophies, although at least she has, like, something. Bobby doesn't seem to have anything. He hasn't even, like, begun to step into that world yet, so uh, she's a little bit ahead of him, but still very, very unprepared for sort of what she's getting into. Marie is just floating through life like a majority of kids are so lucky, so fortunate to be able to do, casually picking up beliefs and ideas that she doesn't fully understand quite yet. Bobby, did you know that the average person consumes 500 chickens? That's enough chickens to feed a whole starving village. But they shouldn't eat them. Because that's bad. And so is it any surprise that, when she's alone with Bobby, Marie decides to act on an impulsive feeling without considering what effect it may have on him in the long term? No, of course not, because Bobby's just a funny kid who makes her laugh. And what do teens typically do with other kids their age who happen to make them feel, like, really happy? Well... You want a kiss? <laughs> You little nasty. You see, you see, this is why I typically don't show my face on here because I don't want people to start throwing smooches at me in real life just because I happen to be a funny online skeleton man. I got places to go and chili dogs to eat and getting recognized as, hey, it's that asshole reviewed to death and being assaulted at the Costco by your hideous lip flaps ain't on my grocery list, babe. Unfortunately, Bobby has his soul sucked out by Melina and is left a changed lad. All right, see you around. Okay, so before we all go ooh, like it's a cheesy studio audience, let's also remember that Bobby has technically already shared his first kiss with Connie, but that was more of an experimental, like, oh, just friends testing the waters type deal. Although he did seemingly assault Nancy at the end of that episode, so perhaps that was his true, like, first kiss. This kiss with Marie, though, was far more aggressive and to the point than anything from before, so it isn't really surprising that Bobby undergoes a dramatic change in his mood. When the next day arrives, we see that the boy comes out with a pep in his step and is left feeling like a million bucks. Mom? Dad? Did you see the sunrise this morning? It was the same color as my girlfriend Marie's hair. I always interpreted this line to mean that Bobby stayed up throughout the night, probably filled with all kinds of new and exciting hormones and adrenaline that kept him awake and allowed him to watch the sun come up, or perhaps that he had the most satisfying slumber of his entire life and woke up early with a heavenly sense of place about him. In either case, our favorite fruit pie fanatic has tasted the sweet ambrosia of love, or at least what he thinks is love. Things start to get a little dicey when he begins to disregard the wishes of Connie and Joseph, instead deferring to whatever Marie wants to do. Let's go bike riding. Yeah, that's a little boring, Connie. I mean, maybe there's something else we all could do? We could go shopping for clothes at the mall. Hey, that's a great idea! Ah, soak up that mall life as much as you can, girly, cause Wetzel's Pretzels and Forever 21 won't be around well, forever. Now, what is a little weird is how, during their trip to the mall, Connie and Joseph go missing, and we aren't exactly sure of what happened to them. I wonder what happened to your friends. I don't know. They were following us to the mall, and then they were gone. It feels like a scene was lost here, one where Connie and Joseph collectively decide to say, like, screw this mess and ditch out on this vapid shopping spree. 
Perhaps if the BLT vegetarian scene from earlier had been trimmed down a little bit, then we would have had room for something like that where we get to see Connie and Joseph decide to get out of there. Or hell, you know what? I actually would have preferred if we'd replaced that BLT thing from earlier entirely with this whole like Connie and Joseph thing, as that would have made Bobby feel like he's really isolating himself just a little bit too much from his alleged friends. I mean, it really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things whether we swap out this scene for that scene, as we can just assume what happened with Connie and Joseph, but it is a little galumphing. Hey, galumphing is a word. It means lamb. Lamb of God! What's far more important to mention is how Bobby is beginning to display some rather concerning signs of being a, uh, <laughs> okay, what we call out here in California a crunked up little degenerate Dogtown Baja bastard. For you see, when he brings Marie back to this mysterious outdoor couch, he tries to recreate the circumstances of their first kiss, and uh, <laughs> gosh, there's no other way to say this but to just come out and say it, he is doing so in a horribly manipulative and gross manner. Oh, look. The couch. You want a kiss? Nah, you have to respect my needs too. Yep, that's right. He is flying all of the classic creep red flags. I mean, let's get a bulleted list going here. He's guilting someone into showing affection with a like, hey, you owe me style of argumentation. He's not taking no for an answer. And of course, he's gaslighting her because what does Bobby say exactly? You know, Marie. The other night, when you wanted to kiss, I didn't feel like it, but I did it anyway. Well, son, call yourself a creative writer there, because you're really spinning an interesting bit of fiction, because that is not how that moment went down at all. Sure, maybe Marie jumped the gun a little bit, but Bobby was clearly on his way to saying yes in a very wordy way. Don't believe me? Well, roll the clip, Johnny. You want to kiss? Well, I'll try anything once. I didn't think I'd like fruit pies, but then I tried one, and if your kiss is anything like a fruit pie, I'm sure I'll... You little nasty. So excuse me, Bobby, you saying that you didn't want to kiss Marie the other night is patently false, unless of course you're talking about some other instance that we didn't get to see, but I really don't think that's the insinuation here. Even though Bobby is so obviously being a little piece of shit in this instance, from a storytelling perspective, I'm actually really happy to see that Bobby is acting in this horrible way. Because it really goes to show that there are indeed things about Bobby and his behavior that would turn Marie's affection away from him, and that he's not just being like a pure charmer through and through, a perfect angel that Marie just decided one day to arbitrarily throw away for somebody else. That's actually the direction that I think a lot of lesser shows would have taken just to have the relationship blow up because Marie went for some other person, a bad boy, the evil Bobby Hill, the, uh, <laughs> the guy who's like uh, the opposite of Bobby. He's tall and handsome, but he's like mean and evil and he treats her really bad. And it's like, oh my God, I can't believe she would throw away her perfect relationship with the perfect little boy, Bobby Hill there, just for this shallow experience. <laughs> ah, she really lived to regret that decision, I bet. Ha ha ha, you know, and we'd get an evil little chuckle out of that thing thinking that she deserves a life of misery just for breaking Bobby's heart. No, instead the show did a great job of showing us that there were indeed problems in this situation from both sides. <gasps> Bobby? Connie? He likes to watch. Bobby's pretty much just got two goals in mind, being with Marie as often as he can and kissing her whenever possible, and may God damn whatever tries to get in his way, God included. In fact, it isn't even enough that he's getting all of these unearned smoocheroonies, although that is concerning, it's also that he feels the like really strange and kind of creepy need, this urge to go flaunting this act to his parents, like what the fuck are you doing? She still likes lots of things I like, like Kissing, for instance. <gasps> So while yes, I could focus on Hank's hilarious discussion about the evils of vegetarians, I instead want to break down this very interesting little bit of verbal fencing that goes on between Bobby and his mom. It begins when Peggy has the very reasonable concern that Bobby is perhaps a little too young to be on the makeout market, to which Bobby then responds with this like weirdly detailed and awful account of like <laughs> how good he is at the act of kissing. Like Jesus Christ, man, what are you doing? You should have seen it. She bent my head back. She tucked her <gasps> Bobby, hand. Bobby! Even if you're someone who thinks that he's at the right age for kissing, going into poetics about the finer details of pushing plaque at each other is a freaky thing to do at the family dinner table. 
When Peggy reacts negatively, saying, Uh, Bobby, you should be afraid of Goyles, our fat white lump immediately goes on the defensive and leaps straight for his mom's jugular. You're just jealous because you aren't as in love as me and Marie. And despite the fact that the kid is intentionally provoking Peggy, her first two responses are very measured and reasonable. Here, I'll even show you Bobby's first two attacks and then how Peggy decides to counter them. Because you aren't as in love as me and Marie. Bobby, I really don't think you can compare a two-day infatuation to a 20-year marriage. You know, I don't think I've ever seen you guys kiss. Your father has kissed me. Peggy! The kid is so poking the bear here, really trying to draw his mom into a fight, which, as Leanne can tell you, is not a wise decision. He's obviously doing this to draw the conversation away from the main point that he cannot contest, namely that he is too young and or immature for this Marie situation. So instead, he is trying to make this into a competition, one that he feels he can win. In fact, the Alpine Shepherd shithead is so sure of himself that he actually begins to look down his nose at his mother, spitting out a harsh sneer of haughty superiority, one that Peggy is 100% justified in shooting the fuck down. I'm not afraid to show my love. You are. Your father and I have done things you can't even imagine. Peggy, please! And Bobby's words clearly do have an effect on Peggy, you know, something got through the armor there, as she later tries to show affection towards Hank, and it goes, uh, rather poorly. But Peggy, what are you doing? Hank, remember how we used to hold hands in broad daylight? I wish I could, but my hands are full, see? Well, I guess Bobby was right. This romantic distance between the pair isn't really resolved until the Naked Grill Dream episode, which is crazy that that's actually an accurate description of a real-life King of the Hill episode, and not like an embarrassing bit of deviant fan art, but I'm happy to say that there is some unrest being set into our mental ovens this early in the series, preheating us for the eventual full discussion later. And although this is just a quick gag, and a funny one at that, it is pretty sad to see that these two can't even hold hands. Or get a room, you two! <sighs> and just consider that for a second. You've done everything right, everything that is demanded in our oh-so-heterosexually dominated world, and yet you still have to keep your hands to yourself. You married young, you aren't cheating, and you stick to the oh-so-important fundamentals of the bedroom, and yet the societal pressure to hide even basic gestures of affection is so great, so overwhelming, that even a brief bit of finger-fondling allows strangers to cook you like you're a steak on the Wagner Char King. An Imperial, no less. Hey, you two, I'm trying to eat. No wonder the boomers gravitated so heavily towards the I hate my wife, take my wife, please style of comedy. Hate was the only strong emotion that they were allowed to express. Oh, and a totally pointless side note to all of this, which I think could probably just be the slogan of my channel, but I really like Peggy's nails here. Good for you, girl. And I suppose the whole Peggy-Bobby fight ended amicably enough as Marie comes by to pick up Bobby and neither of his parents say boo about it, even when a rather, uh, <laughs> disturbing set of facts comes to light. Bobby's Marie is 14 years old. What are, oh god, that means when she was three, our Bobby was only one. Gringos. Hmm, someone should really write a dystopian short story or novel where people can only get married if they're born on the same day, same year. I guess that means that Kyle Rittenhouse and Greta Thunberg gotta get hitched. <laughs> Yikes! While the astrology community desperately tries to square how those two can possibly be born under the same star sign and end up the way they are, we get to behold Bobby and Marie recreating the classic dance scene from Pulp Fiction. Gosh, they are both so, so awful. At least Bobby's trying to keep the laughs going with his vaudeville-esque style of dancing. Always a performer, that one. But at this mysterious basement party, which I have no fucking idea of where these people even are, Bobby's hopes of making out with Marie in a stranger's house soon fall to ruin as he beholds a sight so shocking, so uncouth, so, like, bleh, that it causes him to be animated in a full 180 degree turn. And ah, uh, just like when a weeb's body pillow decides to jump out of a car window, this is when the whole fantasy world that Bobby has built up for himself comes crumbling down. If the lady doesn't want to dance, don't make her dance! Hey, come on kid, move out of the way. Bobby, move. Marie! Bobby! 
Toby, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, oh, sweet sorrow, my old friend. Just look at Bobby, tears in his eyes, hyperventilating from the realization that his so-called relationship was built on a foundation of sand. What about us? You're supposed to dance with just me. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the supposed does when uh, in reality you're supposed to be getting me pictures of Spider-Man, Parker! And Bobby's embarrassing panic attack causes Marie to distance herself from the situation, withdrawing any of her lingering affection and even recontextualizing everything that's happened so far. We kissed! Yes, and, and looking back now, maybe that was a mistake. <laughs> mistake! <laughs> That was the single most important thing in my life! That is a great, stupendous, amazing, perfect voice crack there. Oh my goodness, the emotion is so palpable, so raw, it's excellent. Now, was Marie fair to do all of this to Bobby? Well, I would say both yes and no. It's very clear that she offered too much affection to someone who was not prepared for these intense passions, but I also think that she expressed her own thoughts and feelings about ending things in a very firm, fair, but compassionate way. For example, she isn't doing the breakup in front of the whole party or like laughing at Bobby or anything like that. She's just really unprepared to clean up this whole mess and so she's sweeping it out into the street and putting it all out of her mind. Bobby, you're a funny guy. You make me laugh, that's all. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! And I think this really goes to prove what I've been arguing since the beginning, that Marie is also just a dumb kid like Bobby. Because I think it's really easy for us to look at someone like Marie, who is both level-headed and witty, and just dump all the blame on her for letting this whole thing get out of hand, but let's not mistake personal composure and intelligence with maturity. And yes, Marie may be the older one of the pair, but they're both essentially just still babies making infantile decisions, fumbling about without much direction or knowledge of how to conduct themselves. Although that is coming from me, an old man who considers anybody under the age of 24 a mewling fetus. <laughs> Although, trust me, there are some people out there that never really grow up for better or worse. These two, though, they are very much two sides of the same coin. He is someone who is obsessing over every detail, while she is someone who doesn't think about a situation beyond the surface level. And even with that said, I do really want to give Marie a lot of credit for giving Bobby a final compassionate goodbye. Tell me why you were dancing with all those guys! Goodbye, Bobby. You kissed me. That means we're back together again. I don't think so, Scooter. Trust me, little gestures like that mean so much for the act of closure, so good for her for having enough of a good heart to do that critical act of kindness. It shows that she didn't exactly regret the time they spent together and that she still has some basic level of care for Bobby as a human being. Which is more than I can say for a few of the people that I've dated, unfortunately, but uh, hey, come on now, that's just part of the game. Sometimes things end amicably and other times you get ghosted for three weeks and then you just get a text that reads, quote, I don't feel anything for you anymore. Goodbye. On Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, now that's how you end a two-year relationship, kiddos. Take notes. So I am very, very proud of Marie for giving Bobby the dignity of that last in-person farewell. Too bad the heartbreak kid goes and ruins the moment with one last desperate gasping plea for her to please, please, God, come back. Look, I'm doing your favorite comedy bit. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Ouch. R.I.P. Bobby. Let's give him a moment, folks, just to compose himself. Better still, let's allow him to mourn for the relationship that never was. And you know what? Fuck it. This next edit is for all of the spurned hearts out there, because I think every one of us, at one point or another in our lives, has felt overwhelmed by sorrow, whether that be romantic or platonic or just like the crushing, like, <laughs> influence of life. You know, it is it is really hard out there. So this next one is for all of us. Those who've ever awakened to find a breakup text on their phone. Those of us who've ever seen a grim Facebook post from a friend or family member. Those of us who've been callously fired over the phone. For all of the hollow and discarded, let the dulcet tones of Daisuke Ishiwatari break our weary souls. If you cannot stop this pathetic time, oh, bring back, 
I can't believe that YouTube actually allowed me to make a whole ass AMV in 2024. That is wild. But let's forget about that magnificent and oh so sorrowful bit of editing, one that brought tears to an entire generation because here comes the absolute best part of the whole damn episode. When Bobby goes running on home, weeping like a little French girl, Hank sees his son bawling his eyes out and makes perhaps the most fatherly assumption of all time. Somebody push you off your bike, son? I love that that is Hank's first impression. It really drives home how much of a little kid Bobby still is and perfectly contrasts against this very adult feeling of sadness. And as for Peggy, uh, well, she still hasn't forgotten how Bobby behaved at the dinner table and decides to use this opportunity to calmly but decisively show Bobby how wrong he was to be a little bastard. Oh. It doesn't feel so good, does it, son? No! I guess your love wasn't as strong as your father's and mine, now, was it? No, it wasn't! Don't ever wage a war with Margaret Hill. She will win that battle of attrition and strike you down when you are at your most vulnerable. That's what makes her a god. Some would say that Peggy is being unreasonably cruel to Bobby, but I would say that she is just finishing a fight that he dragged her into and is securing a decisive victory royale. Plus, and this is big, this is huge, this is super, super important to say, after Peggy delivers her emotional fatality, she does provide Bobby with a degree of comfort when he's going through the worst stages of his depression. She gets the W and then moves on. No, fly your bird. Not now. I'm so lonesome, I could cry. And depressed he is. He goes through all the big stages, from weeping uncontrollably to running out of tears and simply floating through a malaise of misery, to wanting to radically change his life so that he'll never hit anything like this ever again. Honestly, the most realistic part of Bobby's depression is how he positions himself in very public places to express his woe, clearly wanting to be comforted by somebody, anybody else. These days, people are much more likely to do this kind of thing on social media by vague posting and wanting their friends to reach out to them, which often ends with the sad poster feeling even shittier when their friends don't reach out, which then creates this vicious cycle of sinking ever deeper into your depression. Believe me, folks, just reach out to somebody that you trust with clear and concise language, for God's sakes. Don't wait around for someone to notice that you're having problems and decide on their own to come save you, because most people just assume that you're able to deal with your problems on your own and won't want to get involved. Asking for help may make you feel a bit like a burden to other people or like a dying animal crying out, please God, somebody help me, get me out of this tar pit. Ugh. You know, I get that mindset, I really do, but asking for help takes guts and I know that you can do it. If I can, then you certainly can do it. And for Bobby, instead of locking himself in his dark room and disassociating there like a normal person, he instead chooses to plop himself in the living room, which is the very hub of the Hill family's daily goings on. Well, he stopped crying. That's a step in the right direction. And the boy's taste in music's getting better, too. And now, finally, it is high time that I address this episode's B-plot as Bobby takes himself out to that oh-so-mysterious couch and interrupts the fantastic side story that has been going on in the background. Essentially, the guys go out to their usual drinking spot and discover that a couch has been unceremoniously tossed into the alley, which is sort of fitting for an episode all about being dumped. This leads to all kinds of humble little jokes about how the guys are so stuck in their routine that they are unable to process this disturbance. It could be weeks before the city comes and hauls this away. What? You say something, Hank? 
Thematically speaking, this is very similar to how Marie suddenly appeared in Bobby's life and he wasn't sure how to deal with the change, much like how Bill doesn't quite know how to deal with the change that he finds in the couch. Eh, see a little bit of wordplay there. Eh, eh. But as the days drag on, the guys come to realize that the couch doesn't have to be an obstacle and can instead be a source of comfort. <sighs> Bill, what are you doing? I'm drinking beer. I'm sitting on the couch and I'm outside. God, I cannot watch this episode without being reminded of how this couch scene was the crux, the very heart of the Season 2 DVD menu. And you know, even though this whole couch thing is about as down to earth as the whole pit crew plotline from Bobby's saga, I find this one far more enjoyable to discuss. Sugar Cube! Have a little pride, Bill. Mm. If we eat their garbage, we're not much better than they are. The guys are actually showing a very endearing level of care and affection for this ratty old couch, with them maintaining it and really flexing their craftsman muscles, instead of just going through the more typical and expected motions of just being a competent pit crew. In fact, when a couple of garbage men come to collect it, we see that Hank has become just as attached to this couch as the rest of the guys. You're not taking it! Sir, can you ask this gentleman to get off the couch so we can do our job? Bill, don't move a muscle. I should also point out how the show has decided to use the like most absolute generic disaster music sting ever to punctuate this moment. Ah! Ah! Red alert! The garbage jug here! Like, I'm aware that most shows mostly just pull from the same pool of sock sound effects, especially for small stuff like this that nobody else is gonna care about except for asshole content creators on YouTube desperately looking to bloat their videos' runtime. <sighs> but I still find it pretty funny to hear something so generic in a show as well-financed as King of the Hill. And while yes, the sound effect is indeed pretty basic, the show more than makes up for that with some really eye-popping animation flourishes. Specifically, I adore how the garbage men are reflected in Dale's sunglasses, with them being rendered in a more fish-eyed perspective than we might expect. There's also this really fun and kind of cute phone cord divider when Bill calls up Dale to talk about the couch. That like little border right there between them is so cool. That's one of those super fun little extras that they definitely didn't have to do, but it really adds a neat flavor to the scene. However, the apex of animation for this episode, and the thing that I'd argue is the best bit of visual flair for the entire season, is when the guys bring the couch into the alley and show off all of the cool modifications that they've been making to it. As we watch this one continuous shot unfold, notice how each guy is moving on his own routine, with Bill getting the cooler, Dale and Hank setting up the awning, and Boomhauer doing a frankly stupendous job of folding that big cloth all by himself. There are so many moving parts and cool little layers to this one scene, it's honestly pretty dazzling. And best of all, it ends with Bill tossing Boomhauer a beer, settling the guys in to their perfect spots. What did you do to my old couch? We're not falling for it, Con. Oh yes, and we discovered that this couch actually came from Khan's house. Surprise, surprise. And this wasn't super necessary for them to clarify, but I am really happy whenever they can work Khan into an episode, especially when they give him two great zinger jokes. Now he wants it back. Grim, are you crazy? Oh hey, I got an old pair of boxer shorts you can use as a tea cozy. Want that too? Ha 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 ha! And sticking with our favorite Laotian family, the C-plot that's also going on has to deal with Connie and her growing affection for Bobby. This is a really, and I'm talking really minor story beat here, but it just goes to show the commanding way that the writers are able to introduce new concepts throughout the show, concepts that eventually grow into their own little story arcs. Essentially, Bobby's romance with Marie has really shaken Connie up, giving her a feeling that is uh, quite familiar to anyone who's still single over the age of 33, namely that certain opportunities, romantic opportunities, have begun to fade away and may eventually move beyond your grasp forever. Well, it's made me realize that I really like Bobby. Now, the writers easily could have just framed this as a simple jealousy story where Connie is only interested in Bobby because he's dating somebody, but I feel like they made a deliberate choice to make it feel like it is something more substantial than just that. This isn't as simple or trite as just like, ooh, that boy belongs to me and no one else, no one else can ever have him, ooh ha ha Or even like, ooh, I'm only interested in him when he's like unavailable, when I can't have him, that's when I want him the most, bleh. You know, not that, not at all. Because even after the pair break up, or whatever the hell it is, I guess it wasn't like technically a relationship, but you know what I mean, I'm just using the phrase relationship as a sort of like catch-all for uh, whatever the fuck was going on there. After that whole thing breaks up, Connie still shows a budding interest in Bob 
Bobby. So I would hardly characterize this as a shallow infatuation, but rather a dawning realization that seeing Bobby date somebody else is surprisingly upsetting to her, making Connie take stock of how she really feels. And thank goodness that sweetest Luann is here to help Connie sort out all of these complicated emotions. If you and Bobby are meant to be, then it'll happen. I mean, Buckley and I weren't meant to be, and that's why he blew up. I mean, that whole Megalomart explosion and Buckley's funeral did just happen in the context of the show, like one episode ago, so like one week ago. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's not really surprising that it's still on Luann's mind. Also, I want to briefly talk about Luann's hairstyle here, as uh, we are going to get several different looks over the next few episodes, and I want to kind of address them as they come up. And for this particular episode, uh, well, I have to say, you might find this a bit weird, but uh, I actually prefer her totally bald look over this one. If I was going to rip the band-aid off and be completely blunt here, uh, the buzz cut makes her look like a cantaloupe that started to get covered in mold, while the bald look, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm about to say something that's deeply, deeply inappropriate, so uh, either hurry your loved ones out of the room if you're watching it with them or buckle up buckaroo so uh, yeah fair warning here Ugh, here we go okay are they all gone Good. So, frankly put here, the bald look has the benefit that all bald people, men, women, and etc., use it for, namely that it allows you to slather your scalp with man-made mayonnaise and pretend that you're a melting candle. It's called candle jacking, and nobody ever talks about it out loud because anybody who does gets immediately abducted by this goddamn mother... And now, with a rebuttal to the previous scene, is Dr. Gunter Punterhanker. It is physically impossible for such a boogeyman to come and get you simply by saying the words, Candle Jack. Psst. Then again... But putting aside my career-ruining inability to withhold my deranged imagination, I now want us to talk about the finale and why it works so well. For you see, Bobby can't just lay on the floor and listen to Avril Lavigne's complicated over and over again. At some point, he will have to move on to Weird Al's constipated, and boy, does Bobby ever pick the right way to do that. It comes when the Hill family goes to a steakhouse, presumably for steak, and he looks over and sees Marie gasp is coincidentally sitting one table over. That's my nightmare. I never want to see one of my exes out in public like that. Oh, it just, oh, it kills me from secondhand embarrassment. Oh, I can't be here for this. Is that her? Oh, now it all makes sense. She looks exactly like me. So, old Gruntilda thinks she looks like Tootie, huh? Well, that may explain why she thinks she can win that beauty pageant. But yes, Bobby sees Marie and her, like, weird little catty hair flip, and he decides to make one final stand for his own sanity. Would any of you fine folks care to take on our 72-ounce top sirloin steak? Yes, I would. And I want it rare. Oof, rare too? You are one crazy kid, Bobby Hill. All that extra blood is really going to add some, uh, some weight to that steak. <laughs> Talk about eating your raw emotions, am I right? Now, much like a man who makes six figures, this scene isn't particularly long, but it doesn't have to be. It smartly sets up the rules of the contest, does an amazing job of using swelling music to make us feel caught up in the action, and man, is that steak shown in just the right amount of detail. It isn't cartoonishly large like the manhole-sized slab that Homer ate in his own meat-eating competition, but it does have a realistic proportion that does speak to a rather intimidating task. I mean, the meat is spilling over the sides of the plate, for God's sakes. That thing is truly a beast of a steak. I was going to say that it looks a little bit smaller than the steak that Mr. Holloway tried and failed to eat in the company man, although I'm pretty sure this is the same restaurant, so uh, maybe they just have like a kid version of this competition for Bobby to try out. But forget about stupid Mr. Fucking Holloway, because now comes the dramatic moment where Bobby seems finished, he is stuffed, and that means that Marie will ultimately triumph in this little competition that they're having. But then... <sighs> From here, Bobby flies through the rest of his meal, and he even gives the crowd a showman's twirl of his fork in the air on the last bite, but not before he glares at Marie to let her know that this whole thing was indeed a very personal fuck you. And of course, the cherry on top of this whole thing is that Marie's parents are also here and they are actually cheering Bobby on in a way that makes me really think that Bobby would have gotten along with them famously. Come on, Mom! Dad, we're leaving! 
As great as this scene is, I have to point out that it really hinges on Marie being seen as the bad guy. And you know, that mean girl hair flip does feel a little weird, perhaps even out of character, or if I was going to get really extreme, I would say that it's even perhaps manipulative by the writers in trying to get us to feel like she's really like a bad person, which is weird when you stop to consider how compassionately she broke things off with Bobby, so I really don't think there would be any sort of like bad blood between the two, at least not on Marie's side of things. There's also no real self-reflection on Bobby's side, no moment where he thinks back on his own mistakes and sort of like reflects on them, which admittedly wouldn't have been very interesting to watch. I wouldn't say that anything needs to change with this ending, as I think the contest it sets up is an extremely effective and enjoyable conclusion, it's just really tough to try to make Marie feel like a person who deserves this takedown when you realize that she handled her poor decisions as best as can be expected of somebody her age. And believe me, I can already hear some people out there who would say like, well, Marie never should have let this Bobby situation start in the first place. She led him on, so she deserves this giant stake beatdown. Ha ha ha. But I'm the kind of person who really respects those who can own up to their mistakes, probably because I've made so many in my own life that if I wasn't able to accept somebody else's growing moment, then I wouldn't really be able to live with myself. Ugh. Also, it is so, so funny to me that Marie actually stayed for the whole meal and just watched Bobby undergo this Herculean effort, just glaring daggers at him the whole way, and even shouting discouragements at him like it's the goddamn Jerry Springer show. But guess what? Bobby's still a rock star. He's got his rock moves, and he doesn't need her. And guess what? He's having more fun. And now that they're done, he's gonna show us tonight that he's all right, he's just fine, and she's just a tool. But just as one relationship or uh, situation ship, friendship with couch benefits, <laughs> whatever the fudge they had going on comes to a satisfying end, another is cut tragically short as Hank comes home to see that his golden age of comfort has been ripped away. Ah, the couch is gone. No. We didn't even get a chance to say goodbye. Oh, and as a really cute wrap-up to things, Connie approaches Bobby and invites him to come on over and watch some TV, even though he's really going through his own struggles right now. When you finish, you want to come over to my house and watch some television? Doesn't have to be television. Ah, now who doesn't like a wholesome bit of vomiting to end an episode? It's a classic. However, in the true post-credits ending, we see that Bill is actually the one who stole the couch, and he is currently keeping it in his house like a big jerk, which is an ending that I think could have been done a little better. I don't normally like offering my own alternatives because, uh, you know, I'm not getting paid by Fox, I'm not here to write the episode for you, but you know what, I'll do a little bit of charity and do so here. In essence, I think this ending could have been a lot snappier and better if Dale had accidentally burned up the couch with his cigarettes and the credits had shown him digging what he thinks is gonna be his own grave, but it is actually just where they're dumping the remains of the couch. For example, Bill could whisper something to Hank that we get to hear but Dale doesn't, like, uh, hey, should we tell him it's just for the couch? To which Hank would then respond, not yet. Keep digging, Dale. I think that kind of example would really hit the high note of how much this couch really meant to all of them. But my silly fan fictions aside, that's the episode. Bobby has a girlfriend? All right, son. She's real, right? I mean, she's not imaginary or on a cereal box or anything, is she? And you know, I really, like really, really love this one as it takes a very tired sitcom situation and puts a very interesting and well thought out and like really surprisingly emotional twist on the whole thing. This is a much more realistic depiction of how exciting surprise romances can be, the embarrassing way that we screw them up and sometimes the glorious ways we have of coping with the aftermath. It gave Bobby an incredible amount of great spotlight moments and was even generous enough to spread its strengths to Peggy and the guys as well. You know you have to put it to a vote if you want a family member to use a couch. It is so amazing that they already have little systems like this in place, little like democratic rules for all the functionings of the couch, like who's allowed to use it and when. <laughs> It's just, it's so damn good. I suppose that my only true criticism would be that Marie has a seemingly endless amount of friends, none of whom really have anything meaningful to do or say, and are only around for super small scenelets, the social equivalent of fruit flies, only alive for meager moments. 
I would have liked to have seen some of her friends, or perhaps even Marie herself, stick around for future episodes and just like, you know, flesh out Tom Landry Middle School's cast a little bit more, just so we get like a bigger appreciation of who the hell's going to this uh, school here. <laughs> uh, but that's about all. Otherwise though, this is an all-time favorite of mine through and through. Tonight you're going out on a date with your parents. And we know how you like going out with people older than you. <laughs> But this was only a child's romance story, one where we could forgive their silly little missteps and foibles. For the next episode, we are really going to have to step up our game and try to puzzle out one hell of a Gordian knot. That's right, pretty soon Peggy will have her rose-colored glasses ripped off and be exposed to the fleshy truth. I have my reasons. Yes, and I've seen those reasons packed into his Sergio Valente jeans. But that's for next time. For now, we can say that this episode, titled And They Call It Bobby Love, has indeed been... Reviewed to death. Thanks for sitting on the couch with me and dancing the night away. I'll see you in the next review. My dad says if God didn't want us to eat meat, he wouldn't have invented steak sauce. Your dad says that? Once.